Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of IHR TV. In May this year, a wave of protests broke out across the US following the death of George Floyd. The movement Black Lives Matter took to the streets to seek justice for the black communities targeted by state and police violence. The demonstrations began in the midst of a pandemic, which has caused a death toll of 140,000 people in the United States. Peaceful protesters have been severely suppressed and police brutality has not even spared journalists. I am pressed. Please. This poses a question. Is the US response to the protests compatible with the human rights protected under US and international law? Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Professor Rory Lal of the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University. Professor Lal, thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really am I'm pleased to join you and talk about human rights today. President Trump has overseen a brutal crackdown on largely peaceful protests. Over the past few months, we have seen protesters and journalists attacked with tear gas, shot at, pepper sprayed. Is Trump's response to these protests compatible with the human rights protected under U.S. and international law? No, uh, absolutely not. Um, Trump, President Trump has absolutely weakened human rights in the U.S. by responding to these protests with what can only be considered authoritarian violence. And I mean, according to the United Nations, law enforcement in countries must protect Uh, peaceful protesters and use only minimum force and only when absolutely necessary. And the UN Human Rights Committee this week just said that disrupting peaceful protests is a sign of repression. So I do think that unfortunately Trump has gone down uh, the road of um, what can only be termed repression. Even at the beginning of the protests, he started off signaling where he was going by saying that when the looting starts, the shooting starts, which is a phrase that very much glorified violence and signaled where he was planning to go with this. And even though there was really, I would say, relatively little violence at the protests, um, he sent in the National Guard and militarized police. And, and as we saw, as you mentioned, it, you know, you have the attacks on journalists, on protesters, and this very much culminated uh, very recently in the actions in Portland, Oregon, where you have even, um, you know, unlabeled agents in unmarked vehicles snatching people from the streets and uh, not using warrants. The Attorney General Barr uh, is trying to argue that violent rioters and anarchists are wreaking some kind of senseless havoc and destruction, but this is not a reflection of the reality on the ground. So um, what we're uh, hoping to see is more of a pushback. Uh, we already are seeing the Oregon attorney general saying we're going to sue the federal agencies and other cities and states saying we are not going to put up with this. Professor Lal, President Trump has tried to justify his crackdown on the BLM protests by branding protesters as Antifa terrorists. How does falsely prescribing ordinary citizens as terrorists undermine American democracy? Well, you know, when you label ordinary citizens as terrorists, you criminalize them and you are basically attempting to remove them from the political process. And Trump is trying very hard to do this. He's trying to delegitimize the protests. And I mean, I think a broader way of looking at this is, is the word terrorist. It is an ambiguous term at best already that even inside the US, the State Department and the FBI do not agree upon. So the State Department definition is much more of one that many people would recognize, focused on violence, on civilian targets by subnational groups. Uh, a more traditional definition. But the FBI has a very broad definition that the Trump administration is trying to use and even stretch. And it's talking about the unlawful use of force against persons or property that's very broad and in order to coerce the government. And so even though during the protests, we see white supremacists and these people called Boogaloo boys um, in many instances causing violence, 
um, Trump blamed the extreme left and called them, you know, Antifa, and then labeled the Antifa as a terrorist group, even though this isn't really even a proper group. And then he, through doing this, he is basically building an extrajudicial process to criminalize normal civilians. And, and in this way, what he is attempting to do, as any authoritarian leader does, he's, he's trying to create an enemy of his opposition. Um, and then, and then, and then, I mean, if you can cast your opposition as terrorists, then they are viewed as anti-national and, and this fundamentally undermines democracy by eliminating the opposition and even taking them to prison. In a wider context, how and to what effect do other regimes use the terrorist label in similar ways? Well, China has been known to use this quite a bit. Uh, he, uh, China uses the terrorist label against uh, minority communities like the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and also against the Tibetans. We also see the Russians using it in, in very alarming ways against anyone who is uh, criticizing the government against anti-fascists. And even a few weeks ago, we saw the Russians using it against a journalist first. And then the journalist was criticizing state repression. <laughs> so of course the Russians then said, okay, well, that's a terrorist. Um, so, and, and we see in many, in many cases, it's used as a way to validate moves toward war. So for example, you have groups like Hezbollah, which is in Lebanon a legitimate political party, but it also has a militant arm. So you have several countries labeling it as a terrorist group. The problem with simplifying something like this is that it's, it's dangerous because the situation is far more complex. And simplifying it by simply labeling groups that you don't like as terrorist pushes countries into a crude calculation of war in many instances, which doesn't help resolve tensions. How does the Trump administration's response to these protests undermine its ability to speak out against authoritarian regimes committing human rights abuses? What are the wider implications for counterterrorism policies and their effectiveness worldwide? Trump told even the governors of the US, he was very clear. He said, you've got to arrest people, track people. You have to put them in jail for 10 years and you'll never see this stuff again. So he's been very clear that he uh, believes in authoritarian uh, repression of protests and minorities. And what this does is it effectively uh, weakens our ability to respond to actual terrorism. Because what we're finding is that, for example, in the, the US, uh, US criticized China, for example, in Hong Kong, uh, saying that China shouldn't be repressing people during their protests. And then China responded right off the bat with, you know, well, I can't breathe. We got a tweet back from, uh, you know, from the foreign ministry spokesperson. It also allowed China to pursue a conspiracy theory that we don't actually care about human rights at all, and they're actually political motives um, that that are pushing our 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 um, criticism of human rights. So we're we're trying to suppress Chinese companies. Uh, we also see the Iranians saying that the EU is completely blind to Western human rights and only hammering non-Western countries and. Uh, uh, again, a legitimate claim. And then the, the Russians um, criticize us less and in fact have been showing clips on their TV uh, of, of our chaos in the US and our police response at using it as an example. The Russians are, are, are saying that in fact we should repress more, even though in Portland we found that Russian journalists were actually beaten. And then this past week, the Russian ambassador protested to the State Department saying, you're repressing journalists. So the Russians have a little bit of a double standard, of course. But the, the problem is that at what point can we say that a country is truly taking on counterterrorism policies when we are actually needing to use policies against terrorists? When will people believe us? So do you think a disregard for human rights at a domestic level in the U.S. is negatively impacting global human rights? Uh, yes, I, I do think so. Um, I do think that the U.S. needs to do far more introspection in our foreign policy and trying to make it much more consistent internally. So because 
white supremacy and racism and sexism are so entrenched in our own governing systems. The US government has difficulty seeing the human rights problems that exist inside our foreign policy. And, and so there is a um, inconsistency in there. When we look at our foreign policy towards Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, so many different countries, um, we need to think when we are doing these interventions, yes, we may be doing it for idealistic and democratic ideals. However, we need to think more holistically of uh, what type of human rights, what type of impact does it have on minorities? On In other countries, they are not minorities, they would be majorities, you know, um, but uh, people who are black and brown, who in our country we view as minorities. And I do think that 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 uh, connection is missing. I, I think that the US often believes that it is colorblind in foreign policy, but the lack of black and brown Americans in our decision-making apparatus, in our national security and foreign policy decision-making is actually damaging our ability to have these insights and to have empathy for other people in other countries. These protests have taken place in spite of a global pandemic that has hit the United States particularly hard. To date, the US has documented over 4 million cases and over 140,000 deaths, taking the coronavirus and the BLM protests together. How do you think one has impacted the other? Does this context in which these protests are happening make them even more salient? One thing that we have seen is that the coronavirus and the Black Lives Matter protests were very much connected. So early on, the data showed that Black Americans were three, um, more, three times more likely than whites to die from COVID. Um, and, and within just a few weeks, um, we were able to see that, that Blacks had uh, less access to health care more underlying conditions as a result of their less access to health care in, in many instances. They lived in higher population density areas and had jobs that largely could not go remote. But what was surprising and alarm, alarming in many ways was that um, the focus of the government just suddenly withered. You see President Trump stopping the virus briefings by April 27th. And he says that everything is better and he refocuses the message onto the economy. He also did not wear a mask and mocked others who did so. And, and you really see in many ways that his right wing supporters did not want to restrict their personal freedoms because non-whites were dying. Um, just last week, he decided that now the virus is a problem again. When you see the white death rate rising, over 60,000 white people are dead. And he says, oh, OK, well, clearly we have a problem. And now he's attempting to make a little bit more of an effort on it. So when the meat processing plants were hit and you have thousands of people falling ill from coronavirus, he threatens to use the Defense, Produc the Defense Production Act on April 28th just to keep them open and saying that these meat packers have to go back to work in cramped conditions where they're very likely to be exposed and the corporations at the same time were protected from paying out unemployment, from being uh, liable in lawsuits um, and, and, and giving sick leave. So I think that this was a major strike against human rights of the minorities and the poor. And, and it was felt. And I do think that that fed into the protests. I think that the people protesting said, you know what, we're seeing that we don't have health benefits. We're seeing that we are less uh, protected and that the government is really not doing what they need to to take care of us in this crisis. What do you think needs to change in the American political landscape to enhance the rights and protections afforded to minority groups? As things stand, policy often seems to overlook the unique needs of these groups. We cannot expect President Trump to fix it. So what we really need to be thinking is that the rest of the government and people must take this on. So what we need to see is Congress and state governments um, supporting workers' rights, supporting unemployment benefits, uh, supporting increased access to health resources, especially because so many people lose their health benefits in the U.S. with their job. And um, that is something that is, is much less so in, in other countries, especially in Europe. 
Um, we need to fight the police brutality, support black protester concerns, and very much reject the use of militarized force against protesters. So the, the U.S. needs to uphold human rights. And uh, if, if we don't, we really risk erosion of these standards that we've been fighting for for decades. Uh, we also need to increase, of course, the number of black Americans in, uh, and women in national security and foreign policy making. And as the election is looming, I have to ask, do you think President Trump's response to the coronavirus and the BLM protests will affect his re-election prospects? Has either him or presidential candidate Joe Biden made any election pledges relating to the topics we have discussed? Uh, I do think so. I think that uh, I think that Americans are generally dissatisfied with President Trump's Uh, um, response to both coronavirus and Black Lives Matters protests. Uh, people would have expected, especially in response to the protests, that he should have done something to bring the country together rather than be divisive. And similarly, on the coronavirus, he could have taken a stand much earlier saying, you know, people wear masks, people let's protect each other. But instead, he really went down the path of individualism. You know, it's, it's much more important that everyone has the individual uh, right to not wear a mask and not protect others. And I think that that was a very significant mistake that Americans are, um, are keeping in mind as this election comes up. So I do think it's going to affect him negatively. Professor Rory Lal, he has been a great pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you so much. And thank you for being with us for another episode of IHR TV. From myself, Margarita Kargasaki. Until next time, goodbye.